السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على عبدك ورسولك محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد So inshallah today we're going to begin with um, the tafsir of Surah Al-Nas and as we mentioned at the beginning of QP when we first uh, launched these series of lectures we said that inshallah what we were going to do with the tafsir of the Quran is that we were going to start from the end of the Quran and work our way backwards so starting from Surah Al-Nas in reverse order and one of the reasons we did that was because obviously these are the surahs that we're familiar with that we know that we've memorized you know that that we recite most in our salah that our children have studied and know and so on and so forth and so it's something which inshallah we're going to, to focus on, on juz amma surah nas surah farah surah ikhlas work back in reverse order inshallah ta'ala and we're going to um, you know that's like the kind of order that we're going to um, take in the tafsir of the quran but before we go into Surah Al-Nas, uh, one of the things that we touched upon last week very quickly, uh, and I wanted to go into it in slightly more detail today, because it is relevant to the, the discussion that we're having. And that is how the companions of the Prophet wasallam used to divide up the Qur'an. So in our, like for example, the Qur'an that we have in front of us today, whether it's you know the printing that's done in Saudi Arabia, or in Pakistan, or in Egypt, or any other part of the world, what we find is that the Qur'an is now divided into what we call ajza, right, juz. And you have 30 ajza or 30 parts of the Qur'an, and then each one of those ajza is further divided into halves and into eighths and so on and so forth, right? But this is something which came later on in Islam. It's not something which was known during the time of the Prophet So in the time of the Prophet there wasn't something called a juz, right? So we say juz amma. Juz Tabarak, you know, the first Juz, the tenth Juz, the twelfth Juz. This wasn't something known by the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. So that's why you don't find it in the hadith. You don't find a hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ said, or oh, read from Juz Tabarak, right? Or oh, read from Juz Amma. Or tomorrow we're going to study the tenth Juz, or anything like this. Because that division of the Quran was not something which was known or recognized by them. Shaykh Islam ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah ta'ala, in Majmu' al fatawa you know, in his like uh, amazing work that, that's been collected, all of his writings and so on, they've been brought together. Majmu' al Fatawa, he mentions that this uh, division that we have today wasn't something that was known by the companions of the Prophet. And often you find, because in the time of the, of the early Muslims, obviously they didn't have watches and clocks the way that we do today, their units of time measurement were different. So when they would measure something, they would measure it either by verses or by surahs. So they would say, for example, oh, you know, the Prophet ﷺ did something like this, or the time between this and that was a time of 40 verses, or 50 verses, or 60 or 70 verses, meaning what? The time that it takes you to read 50 verses of the Qur'an, that's kind of roughly the time between maybe the Adhan and the Iqama, or between the first Adhan and the second, or whatever it may be. Right? So they would either measure something by verses of the Qur'an, especially when it came to Salah, or the Masjid, or you know things like this, or they would measure it by the Quran, by surahs, right? the surahs of the Quran. So I think the hadith is in uh, is in the Nasa'i, but one of the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is mentioning how the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the length of his salah. So when he would lead the salah as the Imam, what would be the length of the salah? Right? And he would say that Fajr and uh, Fajr used to be from the Tiwal al Mufassal. Right? And Maghrib is from the Qisar al-Mufassal. And uh, Isha is from the Awsat al-Mufassal. Right? And we'll come through these terms now. But they're speaking about surahs of the Qur'an, parts of the Qur'an, surahs of the Qur'an, and this is the length of the Salah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Or for example, you have the hadith in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Salat al-Maghrib, he, he read Surah al-Tur. Right? So he's showing you basically this is the average length of the Salah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The point being here, this is how they would measure. Right? This is the way that they would measure things. It's only after this that we started having ajza and so on and so forth. So in the hadith that is in uh, the Muslim of Imam Ahmad, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he mentions uh, in the hadith of Al-Wathila Ibn Al-Asqa' that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in this hadith is authentic, 
I have been given in place of the Torah the seven. Right? The seven lengthy long swords. And I have been given in place of the Psalms, the Psalms that were given to Dawud alayhi salam, the Ma'een. Right? And the Ma'een means anything around the hundred verse mark. Right? Surahs that are around the hundred verse mark. And I was given in place of the Injil, the, the Gospel, the Mathani. And then I was given extra virtue, the Prophet is saying, with the surahs that are known as the Mufassal. So this is how the Prophet is counting the surahs of the Quran. Right? He's not saying there's 30 Jews, he's not saying Jews 10 or Jews 11 or Jews 12. He's saying that I've been given the Sab'ut Tiwal, then I've been given the Ma'een, the Mathani, and the Mufassal. So he's divided the Quran into how many? Into? Come on, guys. I just got back from a, a flight today. Right? And you guys look more tired than me. Right? I literally like got off a flight. So four, right? You have the Tiwal, you have the Ma'een, you have the Mathani, you have the Mufassal. So the Prophet is, is dividing the Quran in a completely different way, not the way that we know. So what are the tiwal, the seven long ones that he's referring to? Right, this is what we touched upon last week. Right, when someone asked the question about, uh, I think it was Anfal and Tawbah, and why there's no Basmal and so on. So you have Al Baqarah, Al Imran, Al Nisa, Al Maida, Al Am, Araf. No, no. Sorry again, Al Baqarah. Al Imran, Al Nisa, Al Maida, Al Am, Araf, and then Anfal and Tawbah. Right? Anfal and Tawbah are counted as one because there's no Basmala between them. Right? Those are the seven that the Prophet is referring to. Right? I was given in place of the Torah the seven. These are the seven long surahs. They're also called the Sab'ut Tiwal, the seven lengthy surahs. Right? And they take you across like a third of the Quran. Once you finish Tawbah, you've, you've completed a third of the Quran. Those are the seven long surahs. And then he mentions after that the Ma'een. The Ma'een are the surahs come from Mi'a, right? It's the plural of the word Mi'a. Mi'a means a hundred. So anything around the hundred verse mark is considered in the surahs that are known as Al Ma'een, right? And that's like probably the next seven, eight juz, right? So surahs that like go around the hundred verses, slightly below, slightly over, around the hundred verse mark, these are known as the surahs that are Al Ma'een. And then you have the surahs that are known as Al Mathani. And Al-Mathani, um, according to Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu and others, they said that Al-Mathani re refers to the surahs that mention both stories and rulings. Mathani means due, right, due. Mention both stories and uh, they mention rulings. So these are the surahs that, you know, you have all the way up to you start the Mufassal. These are the surahs that have both, right, Mathani, they speak about stories of the prophets, parables, so on and so forth, but at the same time they give you rulings, you know, do's and don'ts, halal and haram, and so on and so forth. And then you come to Al-Mufassal. And Imam Al-Bayhaqi, rahimahullah, he kind of like says that the Mufassal are of three types. So this is the hadith that I was referring to in Sunan al nisa right? But the companion is saying this is how long the Prophet Sallallahu used to read the Qur'an. So the Mathani or the Mufassal begin with Surah Qaf, and some scholars said Surah Hujurat. It's basically the end of the 26th Jews of the Qur'an in our common division and understanding of the Qur'an, it is the end of the 26th Jews of the Qur'an. So you have the Sab'at Tiwad, you have the Ma'een, which are the 100 verse surahs, then you have the Mathani, which are every other surah after, like you know, when the surahs start to get like around the 50, 60, 70 verse mark, all the way up to Surah Qaf, right, the Mathani. When you come to Surah Qaf, all the way to Surah Nas, now you have what is known as the Mufassal. And that's what the companion who narrated the hadith and Nisa'i, he divided into three. So Imam al-Bayhaqi said, what are the tiwal al-mufassal, the long mufassal, from Surah Qaf up until Amma yitasa'alu. So these types of surahs, that length of surah, is the type of surah that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa would lead Salat al-Fajr with. Right? So you're looking at like two pages, two and a half pages, maybe you know, just short of three pages. These are the surahs of the Qur'an that he would lead in Salat al-Fajr. And then you have the next one, which is the middle Mufassal, and that takes you from Amma Yitasa'alun, which is the beginning of the 30th Juz, until Surah Al-Duha. And those are the surahs or the lengths roughly of Salat Al-Isha. Right, like Amma Yitasa'alun, 
you know, like sometimes in the Shams Tukubirat, Abasa, Watawalla, Mutafifin, Ghashia, A'la, Fajr, Balad, you know, these types of surahs. And obviously the Prophet doesn't always stick to this. Sometimes it's longer, sometimes it's shorter. This is like an average, an average measurement of his salah. And then you have the Qisar al-Mufassal, which are the short Mufassal surahs. And by the way, Mufassal means what? Kathratul Fasal. Right, there's many startings and endings, meaning that the Basmala comes often in these surahs, meaning that they're very short. Right, from Surah Qaf onwards, every page, two pages, you have a new surah begin. Right, so they're called Mufassal, meaning that there's lots of starts in them. Right, so they're very short surahs, you're constantly starting a new surah. The Qisar al Mufassal, the short Mufassal, therefore, are from Surah Al Duha until obviously Surah Al Nas, right, until the end of the Quran. And those are the surahs that the Prophet would read, or the length of which he would read in Salat al Maghrib. Another interesting point that you take from this also is that generally when the Prophet would lead a salah, like many or the majority of the narrations that speak about his salah, they speak about him reading surahs and not verses, not passages, not a you know, group of verses. They speak about him starting and finishing a surah. Right? And Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, he says that the reason for this is because when you stop halfway, you're always obviously breaking the meaning of the surah. Right, the surah was meant to be read and taken in its entirety. And obviously, that's not a wajib. You know, like today, it's very common to read you know, verses from here and verses from there. There's nothing wrong, it's not haram. But he said that this wasn't the way that the Prophet ﷺ would lead the salah or read his own Quran. He would take it a surah at a time. Right? So even though those ahadith that speak about his qiyamul layl, when he would stand in the night and he would offer salah, you hear him reading Al Baqarah, right? Al Ali Imran. You don't hear. Or he would read half of Baqarah. Or he read like, you know, a hundred verses of Baqarah. He would finish Al-Baqarah and Ali Imran and Al Nisa. He would take surahs in their entirety. And this is how the Prophet ﷺ used to take the Quran and read the Quran. Right? Even though it's allowed to take less, because we know, for example, the hadith of Ibn Sa'ud radiallahu an, that, he, that the companions would take how many verses at a time? Ten, right? They would take ten verses at a time. Which shows you therefore for study and for other purposes and learning, it's allowed for you to take and you know you don't have to finish the whole surah. But the point is that the Prophet ﷺ in his salah and so on, he would like to keep the meaning together. Right? He wouldn't like to read just verses here and verses there, especially if you don't know, you know, how to like understand the Quran and its meanings and so on. It's not considered nice that you break off this, the meaning of a story or of a surah halfway through. Right? You just stand, stop in a random place. And you stop the surah of the Quran. So the point is that this is how the Prophet وسلم, used to, or the companions as well at that time used to have the division of the Quran. In another hadith, the hadith of Aus ibn Hudayfa, and this is in Abu Dawood and, and other than Abu Dawood, um, he said that I came and I asked the Prophet, the companions of the Prophet, وسلم, how did you use to divide the Quran? How would you divide the Quran? And they said to him, we would divide it as three, then five, then seven, then nine, then eleven, then thirteen, and then the Mufassal. Right? So this is another division of the Qur'an this time from one of the companions. Right? They would divide the Qur'an in three, meaning what? Which three surahs? Baqarah, Al-Imran, and Nisa. And then five, meaning the next five, we would bash them together, which is what? Ma'idah, An'am, A'raf, and Fal Tawbah. Then seven, meaning the next seven surahs, we would batch them together. Then eleven, the next eleven, we would batch them together. Then thirteen, the next thirteen, we would batch them together. And then you come to the Mufassal, and that takes you from Surah Qaf all the way to Surah Al-Nas. Right? So this is how the companions, another narration of how the companions would divide the Qur'an. So where did our division come from, right? Where did it come from that, you know, we, we have the Ajza, first Jews, 30th Jews, and so on. It said that this started, um, you know, Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, and other scholars, they say that it started in the time of Al-Hajjaj, Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. And Al-Hajjaj, I'm sure it's a name that you're probably familiar with or you've heard of or come across. Al-Hajjaj was one of the governors of the Umayyad dynasty, right? So after the, the Khilafah of, you know, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, radiallahu anhu, after they passed away, and Muawiyah radiallahu anhu became the Khalifa, you have the beginning of the Umayyad dynasty, the Umayyads, right? And after him his son Yazid, and then so on and so forth. Al-Hajjaj was one of their governors. Right? Al-Hajjaj, if you look through the books of history, Ibn Kathir speaks about him and Al-Dhahabi and others, one thing that he was known for was, he was known for his brutality. 
and he was known for his oppression, and he was known for his transgression. And a number of the companions died by his order and his command. Companions like Abdullah ibn Zubayr, radiallahu anhu, and other companions of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and many or great number of the major scholars of the Tabi'een, from the students of the companions, they were killed and they were fought and they were persecuted by this man. But at the same time, you know, he did some good, right? Which shows you that there is always a balance between the two. Even like people who do a lot of oppression and transgression can do some good, right? And they can have some, um, some hasanat, some good deeds to their names. One of the things that he was known for was his inaya and his care for the Qur'an and his love for the Qur'an and, and trying to like get people to understand the Qur'an and so on and so forth. And this is like an important point that we need to mention, especially like in the time that we live in today, all of the politics that's going on and all of the craziness that we see across the world, it's very important to be balanced in the way that we act, right? So, you know, we're not politicians and we're not into politics and none of that stuff. But our responsibility as a Muslim who sees what they see on the news or sees and hears things that happen across the world, what's our stance? How do we respond, right? And balance is a very important issue in our religion. Being balanced in the way that you understand an issue, in the way that you deal with that issue, is something which is extremely important. So even like Imam al-Dahibi, rahimahullah, he says about al-Hajjaj, he's a man who did some good, but he had a lot of evil. And his affair is with Allah. Right? Only Allah Azza wa Jal knows how he will judge him. Right? And as Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, rahimahullah ta'ala, used to say, when he used to be asked about the differences amongst the companions and the fighting and the civil conflict that took place between Muawiyah and Ali and others, he used to say, this is something which Allah Azza wa Jal saved my hands from becoming involved in. So I don't like to busy my tongue with, with the same thing. But Allah saved me from this. It's not something which I will be asked about. And so I'm not going to busy my tongue slandering, backbiting, spreading rumors, especially when it's very difficult to understand and know the whole situation. Right? Very difficult to understand what's going on and who's saying what. And we live in a time, as the Prophet ﷺ told us, that a time will come from the signs of Yom Al Qiyamah when the truthful one is considered a liar and the liar is considered truthful and the treacherous one is trustworthy and the trustworthy one is treacherous. This is from the signs of Yom Al Qiyamah. It's very important to be careful in the way that you deal with these issues and the things that come out from your tongue and the way that you deal with these because they're complex issues and they require nuance and understanding and, and so on and so forth. And so it's important to be very careful because Allah will hold us to account for every single thing that we say, every single thing that we do, every single thing that comes out from our tongues, Allah will hold us to account for it. Why we said it, based on what, what were the consequences of our actions and our words and our statements. And so we, this is something that we need to bear in mind. So the point here is that Hajjaj, it is said, he was the one who began this, right? And Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, in his Majmu' al-Futawa, he says that it's said that Al-Hajjaj began this, or it happened during the time of Al-Hajjaj, when he was the governor. And it began from Iraq, and from there it spread across the Muslim world. And Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, says that at the beginning it wasn't known in Medina, or in Mecca, or in other parts of the, uh, parts of the Muslim world, that they would divide the Qur'an in this way. Right? That they would divide the Qur'an into Juz, and Rub' and Hizm. All of these terminologies that we have today in the division of the Qur'an, when you look at the Qur'an and you see those stars and those symbols in the margin, those are things which came after the time of the companions of the Prophet So that's how the companions used to divide the Qur'an, right? So we're going to begin with what is called the Qisar al-Mufassal, the short Mufassal surahs of the Qur'an, right? And we're obviously starting from the very end of them, and that is Surah Al-Nas. Another point that I think is also interesting to mention here, and it's also relevant, is the order of the surahs of the Qur'an. Right? Where did that order come from? And these are issues that are mentioned in the books of Tafsir. Um, you know, how did the ordering of the Qur'an come, the surahs of the Qur'an? Because as we know, the Prophet wasallam received the Qur'an in stages, right? in verses. It wasn't revealed all at once, and it wasn't revealed all in order, in the order that we have it today. It was revealed in stages. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقُرْآنًا فَرَقْنَاهُ لِتَقْرَاهُ عَلَى النَّاسِ عَلَى مُقْثِ This is a Qur'an that we have divided so that you may read it calmly and in a measured way to the people. Allah Azza wa didn't reveal the Qur'an altogether in one. Right? It's revealed in stages, in parts, verses, incidents happen, verses of the Qur'an come, questions are asked, Allah Azza wa gives revelation, and so on and so forth. 
So the Quran was revealed together. And as we know, the, the chronological ordering of the Quran begins with what? Surah Iqra, right? And then Mudathir and Muzammil, and those surahs of the Quran, right? And so it doesn't begin in the way that we are now accustomed to. So the ordering that we have, Fatiha, Baqarah, Ali Imran, and Nisa al Maida, all the way up to Ikhlas, Falaq al Nas, this ordering of the 114 surahs of the Quran, where does this come from? Right. Is this ordering something which the Prophet ﷺ gave us? Is this something which the companions decided upon? Is it something which comes from elsewhere? So, there are a couple of opinions on this. The first opinion is that it was from the Prophet ﷺ. That the Prophet ﷺ is the one who set the order of the surahs of the Qur'an. And so even though he received the Qur'an in, different, in, the, in a different order, and verses were not revealed, like surahs were not revealed in their entirety, but you would have verses from this surah and verses from that surah. But by the end of the life of the Prophet ﷺ, when all of the Qur'an had been revealed, and in his final readings of the Qur'an with Jibreel ﷺ, because as we know, Jibreel ﷺ would come every Ramadan, and he would revise the Qur'an with the Prophet ﷺ. And in the year that he passed away, he came twice in Ramadan to revise the whole Qur'an with the Prophet ﷺ. By the time that took place, the Qur'an had finished its revelation. And so therefore, every surah was read in its correct order. Every verse was placed in its correct place. Right? This verse belongs in this surah, at this place, and so on and so forth. And it is that reading which then came to the companions. They took that as their final reading. And that's where it continued from. So when Abu Bakr عن, came to compile the Qur'an into book form, into mushaf, and then Uthman عن, did the same thing, and he wrote it and whatever, and he spread it across the Muslim world, it became an issue of ijma'. The companions agreed unanimously that this was how the Qur'an is ordered. Right? It begins from Fatiha, ends with Surah Nas, and this is the order in which it's done. This is the, uh, the opinion of uh, a number of the scholars of Islam, and they have a number of proofs for this as well. From those proofs are the hadith that we mentioned before, in terms of how the Prophet ﷺ and the companions used to divide the Qur'an. Right? So when the Prophet ﷺ says that you have the Sab'u Tiwan, then you have the Ma'in, then you have the Mathani, then you have the Mufassam, what are the hadith that the companions used to count it as three and then five and then seven and nine and eleven and thirteen? It means that there was a well-known set order amongst the Muslims during that time. Right? And then you have other hadith, like the hadith of or the, the statement of Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an, which an Imam Bukhari rahimahullah mentions in his Sahih. He says, Surah Al-Isra, Al-Kahf, Maryam, Taha, Anbiya, these were from the early revelations. Right? They were from the early revelations, and he mentions them in order, meaning that the companions were familiar with an order of the surahs of the Qur'an. Right? And obviously you, then you have the ijma' of the companions, that all of them agreed that this is how the, the Qur'an would be ordered, beginning from Fatiha to Surah Nas. Another group of scholars said that the order of the surahs of the Qur'an was something that the companions did. So when the Prophet ﷺ passed away, there was no set order of the Qur'an. The Qur'an was revealed, and the verses of the surah were revealed in order. They were placed in order, but the order of the surahs of the Qur'an wasn't something which he left. But rather, it was something which the companions themselves agreed upon in the time of Uthman and so it became an issue of ijma. Right? And the reason why they say this um, is... Because, for example, you have narrations from some companions about some surahs, like Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, and we'll mention this because it's kind of got to do with surah Nas. Like Ibn Mas'ud wouldn't consider, or he wouldn't write surah Farak and surah Nas as being from the Qur'an. And he would say, rather they are du'as, seeking refuge and protection from Allah. Right? And we'll come into this as a whole discussion about his view and his opinion. If you go to the books of Tafsir in Surah Nas and Surah Falak, the Mu'awwidatayn, these two last surahs of the Qur'an, Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an has a view. That is only to him. Right? He's, he's the only one known to have taken this view and the scholars differ, is it authentic, not authentic, whatever. And we'll discuss that inshallah when we come to that point. Or you have the statement of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma uh, and some of the other companions about Surah Anfal and Tawbah because there's no basmala, is it one surah, is it not one, is it two surahs, and so on, right? So there's some difference of being, some of the scholars said, therefore, this wasn't something which was known at the time of the companions, uh, at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, in terms of the order of the surahs, 
but rather it's something that the companions themselves agreed upon and it became an issue of ijma'. And obviously, as you know, ijma' consensus of the Muslim scholars is one of the strongest sources of legislation in this sharia. Right? It is extremely strong because the Prophet ﷺ said, لا تجتمع أمتي على طلالة. My ummah will never unite upon misguidance. So when the ummah unites upon something, then it is something which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants it to unite upon and it is something which is good because all of the scholars of the ummah cannot unite upon misguidance, right? upon something which is wrong. So therefore, and then there are other, uh, you know, like some of the other opinions say, you know, some of the Quran surahs were told to us in order, like Fatiha and Ali Imran and so on, and then other surahs were not, like Anfal and Tawbah, right? And so that opinion tries to merge between the former two opinions. And the strongest of those opinions, and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best, is that it was that the, the, the order of the surahs of the Quran were mentioned by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so the ordering that we have today of the surahs of the Quran is something which was established by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from Surah Fatiha until Surah Al-Nas. Right? And there are, you know, even like logically when you look at this, you have, for example, you know, if the companions were going to do something like order the surahs of the Quran, why not then do it chronologically? Right? Why not do it in another way? This ordering of the surahs of the Quran is very unique. Right? So there's, for example, some surahs that are bunched together, like the surahs that begin with Hamim, right? the Hawamim. The Hamim surahs are all together, and they all begin with exactly the same way. But then you have other surahs that begin in the same way, and they're not together. Right? Like Surah Furqan and Mulk, both of, both of them begin with Tabarak. Right? Tabarak al ladi Tabarak. Right? And then you have, for example, surahs that begin with Alhamdulillah. Right? Like Surah Fatiha, Surah Al-Am, Fatir, Saba. All of them begin in the same way, but they spread out throughout the Quran, right? Even the, the surahs that begin with Sabha Lillah, right? You have in the middle of them, Ila Ja'ak al Munafiqun, right? And so therefore, they're not brought together. So the scholars say that therefore, this ordering that was set of the surahs of the Quran, it was something which was done and given to the companions by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and that's how they memorized the Quran, and that's why when the companions came, to compiling the Quran, other than these one or two points that we mentioned from Ibn Mas'ud and so on, there is no difference of opinion, right? It's not narrated that the scholars, that the companions had a major issue of differing, and some scholars, some companions said do this, and others said do that, and then they like differed and they went back and forth. That's not mentioned in, in, in our books of hadith and history and so on, or even tafsir, that this is how the companions differed over the Quran. Which shows again that it was something that became ijma' because it was something which was set by the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and therefore it was readily and easily accepted by the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam as well. And Allah azza wa jal knows best. The next issue that I wanted to um, also uh, mention in relation to Surah Al-Nas is whether it's a surah that is Mecca or Madani. And the reason why I mention this is because it is an issue of difference of opinion amongst the scholars as to whether Surah Nas is a Makki Surah or a Madani Surah. But before we go into the obviously, therefore, we have to define what is a Makki Surah and what is a Madani Surah. So the Quran is divided into two types of Surahs, right? Makki and Madani, Makki Revelation and Madani Revelation. And the Makki and Madani, um, you know, the scholars have different ways of categorizing them into those two. Some of them looked at it as a time issue, others saw it as being a, uh, a place issue, location issue, and other scholars said that it is to do with the sentence structure and the eloquence of the Qur'an. Right? So those scholars, for example, who said that it is to do with time, the Mecca and Madani surahs, they said that anything that was revealed before the Hijrah is Mecca, and anything post-Hijra is Madani. So anything revealed before the Hijrah of the Prophet from Mecca to Medina, wherever it was revealed, whether it was revealed in Mecca, Medina, anywhere, but it's before the Hijrah, is considered to be a Makki Surah. And anything that is revealed after the Hijrah, post-Hijrah, even if it is revealed in Mecca, like at the conquest of Mecca, the Treaty of Hudaybiyyah, in Ta'if, in Zaqif, when the companions went to Tabuk, wherever it may have been revealed, it is considered to be a Madani Surah. Right? That's the first understanding of some of the scholars. Other scholars said, no, the way that we categorize it is to do literally with the names, right? with place and location. So Mecca surahs are what was revealed in Mecca. 
and what's surrounding Mecca, like Arafah, Mina, Muzdalifa, the areas that surround Mecca. And Madani surahs are what were revealed in the city of Medina and what is surrounding Medina. Right? Now obviously that brings an issue, and the issue is, then what about those surahs that were revealed half and half, or for example, they were revealed neither in Mecca nor in Medina. They were revealed in Tabuk, right? Or they were revealed in you know, like somewhere which is quite far away from either of the two. Which one do they fall in? Yet other scholars, the third categorization of the Mecca and Madani is to do with the verses themselves and the eloquence, right? Because we know that the Mecca surahs are what? Short, poetic, you know, they have a rhythm in the way that they end. There's a certain structure to them and they focus on issues of Iman, issues of how fire, death, Paradise, Qiyama, you know, those types of issues. Whereas the Madani surahs are longer, the verses are longer, they speak more about, um, you know, like punishments and more about uh, halal and haram, more about laws, prohibitions, commandments, and so they take on a completely different structure. So they said that if the Makki surah follows the Makki kind of outline, you know, if it follows the Makki type of structure and so on, then it becomes a Makki surah. And if it follows the Madani structure, it's a long surah, it's long verses, speaks about punishments and laws and so on, then it becomes a Madani surah. Right? So, and the stronger opinion Allah Azza wa knows best, and the one that like most scholars now have considered to be like the way that you categorize this, is that it's to do with timing. Pre-Hijrah is considered to be Madani, post-Hijrah is considered, sorry, pre-Hijrah is considered to be Makki, post-Hijrah is considered to be Madani. Right? And the reason why I mention this here is because it comes down to the central issue of, um, well, two issues. Number one is, was there a cause of revelation for Surah Al-Nas? Was there a reason why Surah Al-Nas was revealed? And number two, when was it revealed? Was it revealed in Mecca, meaning before Hijrah, is it a Mecca Surah, or post Hijrah, and therefore it makes it a Madani Surah? The issue of the cause of revelation of this surah comes down to a number of narrations. And, the, uh, and, and there is a difference of opinion, right? So you have a, a whole body of scholars that says that the surah is a Makki surah, and you have a whole body of scholars and companions who said that it is a Madani surah. Right? And the reason why they differ is because it kind of comes down to the issues that we just mentioned in terms of how you categorize. So those are the scholars who said that it's a Makki surah, they said that, for example, it follows the Makki structure, in terms of its eloquence, the short surahs, you know, the rhythmic in the way that they end, they all end with nas, you know. And so therefore it fits the structure of a, of a Mecca surah, so therefore it was revealed in Mecca. Other scholars said no, it was revealed in Medina. And it kind of comes down to the cause of revelation, and that is that the cause of revelation and the scholars differ. Was there a cause of revelation? Was there an incident that took place that caused this, this surah, surah falaq and surah nas? And by the way, you know, this is a point that we'll come on to. But Surah Farq and Surah Nas are often mentioned together. They're like twins, right? And they're considered, they're both called Mu'awwidatayn. The two surahs that give you protection and shelter and refuge. Right? Because both of them begin with Qul A'udhu. Right? So they're called Mu'awwidatayn. So often in the Sunnah, you find that the Prophet ﷺ refers to both of them when he speaks about them. He doesn't just say Surah Nas or Surah Falaq. He refers to both of them together. Right? And he calls them Mu'awwidatayn. So the, the cause of revelation, some of the scholars said, and especially those scholars who said that, that it is a Madani surah, they use this as an evidence, because this incident took place in the time of Medina, right, post Hijrah, when the Prophet ﷺ was living in Medina. And that is the, um, the hadith that speaks, and, and the hadith in essence is in Al-Bukhari and Muslim, but it has many additions and narrations that are found in other than Al-Bukhari and Muslim as well. And the hadith is the hadith of the um, bewitching of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, when magic was placed upon the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and that is in the hadith of Aisha radiyallahu anha that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam magic was placed upon him when he visited a, a, a tribe or a community of Jewish people, and someone placed some magic in his food. Um, no, sorry, that's a different issue. No, I'm sorry. I'm getting confused between the two. This one is the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha, which she says that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, magic was placed upon him to the extent that sometimes he would think that he did something that he hadn't. 
right? And vice versa, that he had the discipline that he had, right? So just in his everyday normal routine, he will think that he'd done something, but he hadn't. So he'll become confused in some issues of his daily routine, of his day-to-day life. And so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in this hadith of Aisha, and the, the hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim, it's a muttafaq alayhi hadith. The hadith says that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa saw in a dream two men come to him. And one of them sat by his head and the other one sat by his feet. And they had a conversation about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa One of them said to the other, what's wrong with him? And the other one said he's been bewitched. So then he said, who bewitched him? And they said, a man by the name of Labid ibn al-Asam. Labid ibn al-Asam. How did he do it? He took some hair on a comb that the Prophet ﷺ was using and he placed his incantations and his magic upon it and he buried it in such and such a place, in such and such a well. He dug it and he left it there. So when the Prophet ﷺ woke up, he said to Aisha radiallahu anha, I think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me the cure. And he sent a couple of the companions to go and find this place that he heard in his dream. And they found the magic that had been placed, right? Because black magic is done in that way that the remnants of a person is taking his blood, hair, nails, and so on. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ used to tell us that when you take off your hair, your nails, you know, if you're getting cupped and blood is coming out, you dispose of it properly, right? You don't just leave it around anywhere. And so the Prophet ﷺ some of his hair was taken on a comb and magic was placed upon it. And so the Prophet ﷺ was cured because he found it and he, in one narration, it said that he read upon it Surah Falak and Surah Nas. And with every single verse, those knots of magic were untied. Right? Some of the narrations, now that's the hadith in Bukhari and Muslim. And the hadith in Bukhari and Muslim doesn't speak about the revelation of these surahs, it just says that he read over them. Right? But other narrations of the same hadith that are not in Bukhari and Muslim, they say that this is when Allah Azza wa revealed Surah Falaq and Surah Nas. So that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam could protect himself right, and seek refuge in Allah and his protection from magic and shaitan and so on and so forth. Right? And so this is where those scholars who took those ahadith said that this is the cause of revelation. It's the reason why these surahs were revealed, number one. And number two, it is the reason why um, the surah is a Madani surah, post-Hijrah, because this incident that is in a Bukhari and Muslim took place after the Hijrah, took place in Medina. And so that's an evidence that they use as well. But the hadith in its essence in a Bukhari and Muslim doesn't speak um, openly about the issue of surah Farak and surah Nas and its revelation. Right? And so therefore, you know, it's very possible, based upon the hadith, that the hadith was revealed in Mecca, and the, or the surahs rather were revealed before the hijrah in Mecca, and the Prophet وسلم, just happened to read them at this, you know, on this occasion. There is another uh, narration or another statement of some of the scholars of tafsir that they said that the Prophet وسلم, when he would seek refuge and protection in Allah from the jinn and from Iblis and from harm, he would just ask Allah for protection. Right? He would say, Oh Allah, protect me from shaitan, protect me from Iblis, protect me from the jinn, and so on and so forth. And then Allah Azza wa Jal revealed the two surahs, Al-Falaq and Nas. So he started to read them instead. Right? He would read them instead of making just dua. He would read Surah Falaq and Surah Nas. But again, that doesn't speak explicitly about the cause of revelation. It doesn't say that that's why it was revealed. Right? It's just something which took place during and whilst those surahs were being revealed. So therefore, the cause of revelation is something which the scholars um, differ over. Was there a reason why these surahs were revealed? Because as we know, there are certain verses and surahs of the Qur'an, an incident takes place. In Arabic, this is called Asbab al nuzul And there are books that have been dedicated to this science. Why and when were certain surahs of the Qur'an revealed? Right? And we'll mention it in Surah Ikhlas, we'll mention it with Surah al kafirun other surahs of the Qur'an, Right, where the scholars and it's mentioned in the books of Hadith and Tafsir, this is the cause of revelation. Right? Surah Kahf, many surahs of the Quran. Right? So Surah Al-Kahf, which is probably one of the more famous ones, that some of the people of Quraysh, when they wanted to combat you know, the, the da'wah of the Prophet wasallam and the Quran and so on, they said to one another, that this is something new to us, we don't understand revelation. But the Jews of Medina understand because they're people of scripture. They have a Torah. They claim the prophets came to them. They claim that they have revelation. So why don't we go and ask them about questions 
that only a prophet would know. You know, from your scriptures and from your knowledge, give us three questions that only a prophet would know. So that we can, you know, show that this man is false and whatever else. So a couple of them went to Medina and they spoke to the Jewish tribes. And the Jewish tribe said, we'll give you three questions. Number one, tell us the story of the people of the cave. Number two, tell us the story of the king who conquered the east and the west. And number three, tell us about the spirit, the ruh. What is the reality of the spirit? And so they came back and they asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so Allah Azza wa Jal revealed Surah Al-Kahf. You have the story of the people of the cave, Ashab Al-Kahf. You have the story of Dhul Qarnayn, who is the king that conquered the east and the west. And in Surah Al-Isra, Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الرُّوحِ قُلِ الرُّوحُ مِنْ أَمْلِ رَبِّي وَمَا أُوْتِيْتُمْ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا They ask you concerning the spirit and the soul. Say that it is from the knowledge of my Lord, the affair of my Lord. And you have been given very little of that knowledge. Right? And so again, this is something which you know, is considered to be a spab al nuzul. So Surah Al-Falaq, Surah Al-Nas is something which the scholars differ over. Does it have a cause of revelation or not? The ones who say, or the scholars who say that it does, they point to these ahadith. Right? And those ahadith you know, that, um, that mention explicitly that Surah Al-Falaq and Surah Al-Nas were revealed because of the story of Labid ibn Asam and the magic and so on, the narration that is in a Bukhari and Muslim, as we said, doesn't speak about that explicitly. There are other narrations that, are, that do, and the scholars differed over their authenticity. Right. Some of them said that it is authentic, others said that it is not authentic. I think Shaykh Labani rahimahullah, said that it is authentic, one of them. Others said that it is not. And so it is an issue of difference of opinion, and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Right. However, there are other narrations that don't speak about a cause of revelation, but that do speak about the surah being a Madani surah. Right? Being a Madani surah, meaning post hijrah You have two hadith. One is the hadith of Uqba ibn Amir, radiyallahu an, which is in uh, Sahih Muslim. And the other one is the hadith of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, radiyallahu an. And in both of them, they're very similar. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that I have been given Verses this night or revelation has come to me this night or two surahs have been revealed to me this night that I have never been given anything similar to them before Surah Al-Falaq and Surah Al-Nas right? Verses that have been revealed to me that are unique I have never been given anything similar to them before and then he read Surah Al-Falaq and Surah Al-Nas The scholars say why are these hadith or why does this hadith show that this these two surahs are Madani post hijra surahs because of the narrators, the companions. Uqba ibn Amir was a companion who accepted Islam post hijrah And he's narrating the hadith. And Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu an is from the young companions of the Ansar. Like Anas ibn Malik is from the young companions of the Ansar, from that like age group. And therefore, he only became a companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam after the hijrah, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam moved to Medina. And so the scholars say because of these two hadith, both of them narrated by companions who only became Muslim, only became companions post-Hijrah, the surah is a Madani surah, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. This is a surah which um, has many virtues, right, and is mentioned many times in the sunnah in terms of its virtues, and it is recommended that it is a surah that it is read after salah, and when you wake up, and from the morning and evening as car and so on. Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah in his um, tafsir, Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah, he says that these two surahs give you protection, meaning Surah Falaq and Surah Nas, they give you protection from every type of evil. Every single type of evil they give you protection from. Hidden and apparent, every type of evil. And they do it with the most eloquent, most comprehensive, and most powerful words and statements. So these are two surahs that give you protection from everything. Because Surah Al-Nas, as we said you know, before, it speaks about the hidden dangers and the hidden evil. And Surah Al-Falaq speaks about open and apparent evil. So he says that they give you protection from every evil in the most comprehensive and in the most eloquent of ways and forms. And that's why the Prophet used to tell us to read the Mu'awwidatin after every salah. So when you're making your adhkar after salah, it is from the sunnah to read Surah Al-Falaq and Surah Al-Nas from those adhkar. In the hadith that is in Abu Dawood, the hadith of Uqba ibn Amr radiallahu an, he said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa commanded me to read 
Al-Falaq and al nas after every single congregational prayer, every single obligatory prayer. Dubura kulli salah, after every single prayer. Likewise, the Prophet ﷺ told us that it's a surah that we should read in the morning and the evening three times. So from your azkar of the morning and the evening is to read this surah three times. Right? And some of the scholars said, you know, after your fajr salah, after your maghrib salah, you can read it then three times instead of one, and it becomes part of the azkar. And that is because the hadith of Abdullah ibn Khubayb, that he said that I came out to the Prophet وسلم, on a night that was extremely dark and it was raining. And the Prophet وسلم, said to me, read, <coughs> right, or speak, say, قُلْ, say. And I said to him, what should I say? So he said to me a second time, say. And I said to him, what should I say? And he said a third time, say. And then he said to me, say, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقُ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ Three times in the morning and three times in the evening, they will protect you from every evil. And this hadith is in Surah Al-Tirmidhi. So read Ikhlas, Falaq al-Nas, three times in the morning, three times in the evening, they will protect you from every evil. And likewise, at the time of sleeping, the Prophet ﷺ in the hadith of Aisha, Radiallahu anha, she says that the Prophet ﷺ, if he came to his bed in the night, he would put his hands together and he would read and then he would blow in them and he would read, and he would blow over himself three times and he would wipe his face and his body. Right? And this hadith is in Sahih al Bukhari. So the Prophet ﷺ, before going to sleep, he would clasp his or bring his hands together, read, blow in them, and then wipe over his body and his face. And he would read the three surahs, Ikhlas, Falaq, and Nas, and this is in Al-Bukhari and Muslim. And also, uh, at times of pain and illness, the hadith that's also in Al-Bukhari of Aisha radiallahu anha, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if he became ill or he experienced pain, he would read the Mu'awwidatin. He would read Surah Falaq and he would read Surah Al-Nas, and then he would wipe over that part of his body in which he was experiencing illness or he was experiencing pain. Right? And so and there are other hadith that speak about the virtues of these three of, of these three surahs and two surahs, Surah Falaq and Surah Al Nas, and often Surah Al Ikhlas is mentioned with them as well. Another um, point that's mentioned by the scholars of Tafsir regarding Surah Al Nas and Surah Al Falaq is the name. Right? The different names that are mentioned in the Sunnah and in the books of Tafsir for these two surahs. So Surah Al-Nas is known by obviously Surah Al-Nas and that's the most common name that's mentioned, right? And it's mentioned in the vast majority of the books of Tafsir. It is considered and called Surah Al-Nas. That's the name that it is known by. It is also known as Surah Qul A'udhu Bi Rabbin Nas, right? Using the first verse, Surah Qul A'udhu Bi Rabbin Nas and this is the title that was given to it by Imam al-Bukhari in sahih when he speaks about the tafsir of this surah. He says, Tafsir surah, Qul a'udhu bi rabbin nas. Right? And he mentions the whole verse rather than just the word al-nas. And it is also known as the Mu'awwidatin, as we said. Um, you know, and this is, um, Imam al-Tirmidhi mentions this in his, um, in his uh, book of hadith. He calls it the Mu'awwidatin. Uh, and it's based upon a hadith, I think. Um, and that is that the... Uh, the Prophet ﷺ said that you should read the Mu'awwidatin after every salah. Right? And he bases it upon this, um, you know, based upon this uh, narration, he calls it the Mu'awwidatin. And this is also a very common name that's found in the books of Tafsir. That the scholars refer to these two surahs as the Mu'awwidatin. Mu'awwidatin means what? The two surahs that give you protection. Right? From A'udhu. Mu'awwidatin, they're the two surahs that give you protection and they give you shelter. Another name that is also mentioned in the books of Tafsir, or some of the books of Tafsir, and this one's a, a bit of a mouthful, Muqash Qashatin. Right? Say that five times really fast. Muqash Qashatin. Right? The Qaf comes before the Sheen. Right? Muqash Qashatin. What does it mean? It means to free yourself, to absolve yourself. Right? To free yourself and absolve yourself. And so some of the scholars said that. Surah al Falaq al Nas are known as Muqashqashatain that you free yourself from every harm and every evil and so on. However, in the books of Tafsir, um, this name Muqashqashatain is more commonly used to refer to two other surahs. Right? 
either anfal and tawbah why anfal and tawbah what do they what do they speak about? what do they free you from what are they absolving us from from kufr and nifaq right from disbelief and hypocrisy or they're used to refer to surah al-ikhlas and kafir for the same reason because they also speak about absolving yourself from kufr and disbelief and so on right and so you find this in the books of tafsir that they used for these different surahs some of the scholars said that it is also a name that is used to refer to surah al-falaq and surah al-nas and the fifth name right so we have surah nas qul a'udhu bi rabbin nas mu'awwidatain say that again Muqashqashatain and the fifth one is you change the qaf and chin around switch up Mushakshakatain very good mashallah Mushakshakatain right and that's um, mentioned you know Imam uh, Zamakhshari Sakhawi Sujuti others they say that this is also a name that is given to these two surahs and what does that mean it refers to eloquence right? and it refers to um, you know the beauty of the Arabic language, the poetry of the Arabic language, and so on. And that's because these surahs are obviously very poetic in their recitation. Surah Nas finishes, you know, all with an Nas, and Surah Falak always finishes with like a Qalqala, right? Rabbil Falak, Insharima Khalak, Waqab, right? Uqad, and so it has a very nice rhythm to it. And because of that rhythm and because of the eloquence that it has, then it is um, also given this name. Right? So those are five names that you find in the books of Tafsir that speak about these two surahs. Right? Five names for these two surahs. So, or Surah Nas and possibly both of them. So Surah Nas, Qul A'udhu Bi Rabbin Nas, Mu'awwidatain, which means the two surahs that give you protection. Muqashqashatain, with the Qaf that comes first, which means what? To absolve yourself, to free yourself. And then with the Sheen that comes first, Mushakshaqatain, and that means Verses that are or surahs that are extremely eloquent and poetic and so on. Right. You had a question? No, I was just going to say, um, with the Mu'awwidatin, surely it wouldn't be just Surah Falaq, it would be Surah Al-Nas. Yeah, so Mu'awwidatin is a uh, Muthanna, right? It's a, it's a dual. Right? In Arabic language, you have a singular form, dual form, and plural form. So Mu'awwidatin, when you say Mu'awwidatin, it refers to both Falaq and Nas. Right? And that's why the hadith. And the books of hadith and the books of tafsir and when the scholars say mu'awwidatain they're always referring to both surahs not just one right you read both of them together surah falaq and surah al-nas any other questions since we're since we started yeah on that, um, yeah the prophet said in the surah uh, before sleeping three times and blowing his hands or recite at once and blowing his hands three times did the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam Essentially, she's, uh, the person saying, the Prophet recites the three times and blowing his hand once, or recites the surah once and blowing his hand three times. The hadith says um, he would blow once, or he would wipe over his body three times. Okay. So when the Prophet said before going to sleep, he would read it once and he would blow once, and then he would wipe over his body uh, three times. Or maybe blow and, and wipe three times. Because the hadith says he used to do that three times. So it's possible that he would blow and wipe three times. So we blow into his hands and wipe three times. Uh, when reciting the three qunz uh, before sleeping, what's the preferred, the preferred method? Uh, reciting each surah three times or reciting each surah? Uh, okay, so when you read these three surahs, should you read, for example, each surah three times? So Qulu Allah had three times, then Falak three times, then Nas three times, or do you read? Yeah, Ikhlas, Falak, Nas, and then back Ikhlas, Falak, Nas, Ikhlas, Falak, Nas. Um, I think what, like, uh, from what I remember from my teachers doing is that they would read them three times each. So Ikhlas three times, then Falak three times, then Nas three times. But I don't think that it's like a major issue. If someone was to like do it the other way, I don't think that it would be like a major issue, inshallah, and Allah knows best. But that's what I remember from, from my teachers, and Allah knows best. Any other questions? Assalamu alaikum. 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 Assalamu alaikum.
هذه مذكورة في كتب التفسير أنو ناس؟ أوكي I think we'll, we'll mention one more thing, inshallah, that maybe we'll, we'll conclude um, rather than starting the surah. So uh, one of the things that we mentioned earlier on is the um, position of Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu. Right? And that Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu is narrated from him that he wouldn't consider these two surahs to be from the Qur'an. Right? So he wouldn't consider surah al-Falq and surah al-Nas to be from the Qur'an. And this is mentioned, this narration from him is mentioned by Imam Ahmad in his Musnad, Ibn Hibban, and others, that he used to say um, that these two surahs are for protection and refuge, and he wouldn't write them down in his Mus'haf, right, from the, his version of the Mus'haf, the copy that he had with him, he didn't write them down, right? Um, and it's also reported from uh, Imam Ahmad and Al-Bazzar and Tabarani that he said something similar, you know, it's like a different narration and so on, that he... Um, and that he wouldn't uh, write these down. So, what did the scholars say about this particular narration of Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu? There's two approaches that some of the scholars had. The first is to say that they are weak. These narrations from Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, they are weak. So if you look at, for example, uh, Imam al-Razi in his tafsir, al-Baqillani, uh, even Imam al-Nawawi, Ibn Hazm, you know, like a, a group of the scholars, um, they used to say that these Narrations are not authentic. They're not authentic from uh, Ibn Mas'ud, but rather they are weak. You know, they, they're not like authentically attributable to him, and so therefore, you know, like you kind of like come at the issue right? if they're weak and they're not authentic and they can't be established and attributed to him. There's no issue, right? There's no problem, and you know, story done. Close the chapter and move on. However, other scholars, and especially like some of the the specialists in Hadith, like Imam Ibn Hajar, rahimahullah, and others. They said, no, the, the hadith are authentic. Right? So if you look at the chain of narration, they are authentic, the narrators are authentic, that Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, and it's not mentioned just in one hadith book, it's mentioned in multiple hadith books, and it's mentioned from multiple narrations and multiple narrators, that Ibn, uh, Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, by the way, Ibn Mas'ud, as we know, is one of the greatest companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa one of the early Muslims, a major scholar amongst the companions. You know, he's not like just... A young companion or someone who you know was with the Prophet for a year or two or three or four, he's considered to be like up there, right? From the senior early Muslims, from the major companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And there's many a hadith that speak about his virtues and so on. And not only that, but in terms of his knowledge, the companions amongst themselves used to acknowledge him as a scholar amongst them. Right? So for the companions to acknowledge certain individuals as scholars amongst them, you know, that's something like major, right? So Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, Ibn Umar, these companions are well known and they're consider, considered scholars and many of the, of the tabi'een and their students, you know, where we take our knowledge from today, they go back to these illustrious companions. However, Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu was older than them and he's an earlier Muslim than them and therefore, you know, his knowledge is greater than them. Uh, but obviously, because he was older, he passed away before them. So they had more scope of teaching and spreading that knowledge and so on. Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu towards the end of his life, he settled in Iraq. Right? He went to Kufa and, and, and that's where he settled and that's where he passed away radiallahu anhu. And the narrations, for example, in the time of Ali radiallahu anhu, that people used to come to Ali from Iraq and they would come to Ali radiallahu anhu and they would ask him questions and he would say to them, don't you have Ibn Mas'ud amongst you? And they would say yes. He would say, so go back and ask him. Why did you waste your journey, come all the way and ask me? When Ibn Mas'ud lives amongst you, go back and ask him anyway. Right? And you know the companions, especially in the time of Uthman and Ali and so on, they would refer to Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu and they would ask him these questions and so on because of his level of knowledge. So, the scholars who said that therefore it is an authentic, uh, authentic narration to Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, that he didn't write these surahs down, how do they respond then to this issue? They say that there's a number of explanations. Number one is that Ibn Mas'ud didn't write them down, but that doesn't mean that he didn't consider them to be from the Qur'an. Right? He just didn't write them down because he considered them to be so well known um, and so acceptable or so accepted that he didn't need to write them down. And so he never wrote them down, not because he didn't consider them to be from the Qur'an, but just because it's something which he didn't feel the need to do. Right? That's like one 
um, you know, like answer that's been given or one way of, 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 of explaining the statement of Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu. And the reason why they say this is because, number one, there's a hadith, you know, that's well known that the Prophet ﷺ read these two surahs in his salah, right? And he, you know, heard companions reading them and so on and so forth, which shows that it is clearly from the Qur'an, and it's not, you know, possible that a companion of the stature and the knowledge and the virtue of Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu would have been unaware of this, right? Although some scholars did say this, that maybe he was unaware. Right? Because no one companion had all of the knowledge, no one companion was perfect, no one companion had everything. Everyone had mistakes and there were comp- things that even Abu Bakr radiallahu anh, didn't know during his khilaf and he would ask companions, Umar radiallahu anh, didn't know, and other companions would come and tell him. And so therefore like not, no one companion had all of knowledge. Right? And that's why even when the companions came to compile the Qur'an, there was a committee of them. Right? They appointed four or five so that they would all come together and help one another. However, also from what they say, Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an is one of the greatest scholars of Qur'an, right? So when we take our Qur'an and you have your Sanad that goes back of the Qur'an to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one of the names in that Sanad is Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an. So if you pick up that like Qur'an that's printed in Medina and if you flip to the back and they have like two or three pages in Arabic that speak about the Qur'an and how they, you know, like printed the Qur'an and where they took it, you know, how they made sure that it was all completely the way that it should be with no errors and mistakes. They have in there the books of Quran and Qiraat and the great Imams of Al Kufa that we read from. So our Qiraat that we read from is taken from an Imam by the name of Imam Asim, right? Hafs and Asim. So we read by the Qiraat of Hafs and Asim. Asim was from the Qura of Kufa and he studied from the scholars of Kufa who eventually studied like you know, one or two generations above him, they studied with Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu. And in all of those qira'at and in all of those uh, readings of the Qur'an, Surah Al-Falaq and Surah Al-Nas are there. Right? So none of those Imams ever said, no, you finish a Surah Ikhlas and that's it, right? the Qur'an's over. It's done. They all mention from Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu that he read Surah Falaq and Surah Nas. Right? And that is something which is extremely strong in terms of evidence because it is mutawatir. Right? It is something which is widely narrated to the extent that it can't have been possibly a fabrication or lie. It is something which is mutawatir. Because he had hundreds of students and then thousands of students and from generation to generation until our time today we still have a chain of narration that goes back from us all the way to these great illustrious imams and obviously the companions before them such as uh, Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu. So therefore, it's something which he did accept even if he um, chose not to wrote it. As we said, the Prophet wasallam used to read these surahs and he, um, you know, he heard the Prophet and there's a hadith in which the Prophet wasallam recited these surahs in his salah as well. Right? And other scholars said that this was the initial opinion of Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anh, and then he learned that he was mistaken and he retracted. So at the beginning he thought maybe it was just a dua, Right, that the Prophet ﷺ was given a dua and he's reading it as a dua and then he was corrected and he was told that actually no, um, you know, it is part of the Qur'an and he changed his opinion and he said okay it's from the Qur'an and this is what Ibn Kathir rahimahullah mentions in his tafsir that this was the initial opinion of Ibn Mas'ud but then later on he changed his opinion when he realized that he was mistaken and he came back to um, you know, the opinion that all of the companions and all of the scholars have accepted. And that's why the scholars say that it was something which was, you know, it's unique to him, right? It's peculiar just to him. Even the students of Ibn Mas'ud don't accept this. And so they say, therefore, it shows that it was something that he, it was a misunderstanding, he didn't know. But once he learned and he was corrected, he retracted it. And that's why it's not been narrated. Otherwise, his students would have taken it and their students that it would have carried on. You know, they would have been for a number of generations that would have been a common opinion and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. I think we'll, we'll um, stop there inshallah next week ta'ala, we'll actually start with the surah um, because I think we've covered like most of the introductory points to surah al-nas. Any questions? Any? Did you say Ali Abdullah ibn Mas'ud passed away in Kufa? In Iraq he passed away, yeah. I think it was Kufa from what I remember. Or at least that's where he settled anyway. Even if he passed away. I think he passed away in Medina in his grave in Mahim. 
Is there any type of Maybe Allah. I don't know. I don't remember. But I know like he settled for a very long time in Kufa. Most of the knowledge that is taken from the scholars of Iraq, al Hassan al Basri, and the scholars that the great scholars of the Tabi'een, they studied with the likes of Mas'ud radiallahu anhu. But it is possible that he that he moved back to Medina Pasu I don't know. Allah. I don't remember. Anyone else? Anything on mine? Regarding the opinion of uh, Abdullah ibn uh, Abbas and Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, what's the conclusion of their opinion? But I think we discussed that already. Yeah, so I uh, remember like the scholars, like even the companions amongst themselves, you know, that they, they, they can have differences of opinion on certain issues. And like we said, no one companion has all knowledge, right? So sometimes the companion has a view that he didn't like hear or understand. So even in the time, for example, Uthman radiallahu anhu, when he was the Khalifa, he used to say to the people that you have to make Hajj Mufridan, Hajj Ifrad, right? You can only make Hajj on its own and you can't make Tamattu, you can't join your Umrah with Hajj. Even though it's you know, mentioned in the time of the Prophet and there's a hadith and so on, but it's not something which he knew or he considered to be the you know something that should be done. And that's like his view on other companions like Ibn Mas'ud and others from that time, they used to disagree with him openly and say, no, we clearly heard the Prophet say this. So you have companions because you know, like not, no one companion has all of knowledge. Right? No one companion knows everything. Companions used to be absent, they were ill, maybe they didn't hear, they didn't know. And that's why the beauty of our religion is that it's not reliant on one person. Right? After the Prophet it doesn't just rely on one person or two people, it is the whole body of the companions when they come together that gives this this knowledge and this, and this religion its strength. Now, one quick, one last question is uh, regarding uh, Al-Hajjaj. Um, there was a dialogue between uh, Al-Hajjaj and Sayyid al um, where he said some harsh things to him. Uh, in which case, in which case, as clear cut as it is, um, should, should, should we say something about people once, once they're rulers? Okay, so the, the issue of Hajjaj is like, you know, like Allah, and scholars have spoken about Ibn Kathir mentions in Bidayah wa Nihaya, Dhahabi mentions in Sirah Alam al Nubala and so on. And they mention like, you know, the majority of his actions that we know of are actions that were like oppressive and transgressive and so on. And they mention this openly, but then they say, look, he did some good. Like obviously, like, you know, he expanded the Muslim lands and, you know, whatever else he did, like some good. And his, you know, of, at the end of the day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will judge him. The point that I was making is because we live in a time now where, you know, with all this stuff that's going on in the media with certain countries and certain rulers and so on, what I um, want to impress upon all of us is it's a very dangerous issue to get involved in things that you don't understand, uh, number one, and number two, that you don't know the reality of. Because once you open your mouth, it's written down, right? And that's something that you're held to account for on Yom al Qiyamah. And these are issues, especially like because what, what's often happens, especially nowadays in age, right? That most of this stuff is discussed where? On Twitter, right? Or on WhatsApp, right? And these are issues which are extremely complex and nuanced and they require knowledge and whatever. And it's not something that you can do in 120 characters, right? Or something you do in like three or four posts or something that you do on a WhatsApp, you know, like chat group or something. So it's something which requires us to be more mature, number one. Number two, our religion is a religion of balance, right? And it's a religion that's based on firm foundations of the Quran and Sunnah. It's not about what I think or you think or what I hope for or you hope for or what I consider to be good or not good or you. Or, it's not the issue. The issue is this is our religion. Our religion tells us how to behave and how to act in every single issue. Even the Prophet ﷺ in the slander of Aisha radiallahu anha, before Allah reveals her innocence in the Quran for 30, 40 odd days, that period of time, which no revelation came, there were principles by which the Prophet ﷺ dealt with her. Likewise, the people of Tabuk, the companions who didn't go to Tabuk, they didn't have a valid excuse. 40 days, 40 nights, or 50 days and 50 nights, no revelation came. And the Prophet ﷺ dealt with them based upon principles. It wasn't like, oh no, she's my wife, or they're my friends, or I know them, or I don't know them. We have in our religion a certain way that we do things. And when it's based upon knowledge, it is fair and it is just. You know, like one of the things that they say about Hajjaj uh, was that when he was on his deathbed, he made a dua. And he said, oh Allah, these people, meaning the people generally, these people claim that you will never forgive me, so Allah forgive me. Because the people heard of his oppression and so on. You know, like even companions like Asma. Radiallahu anha, the mother of Abdullah ibn Zubayr, the daughter of Abu Bakr radiallahu anha, senior major companion, she's there from the beginning of Islam. You know, like, she's like one of, you know, like an early Muslim from the family of Abu Bakr radiallahu anha and so on. When her son Abdullah ibn Zubayr was killed by the commander of al-Hujjaj, she spoke out against him. 
right? And she said, like there's a narration, she said, which the Prophet ﷺ told us that they would come from Thaqif, his tribe, which is the tribe of Taif, a man who is a liar, and a man who will cause corruption upon the earth. As for the liar, we've already seen him. I mean, the false prophet who came, you know, he came and he went and he's dead. And as for the one who will cause corruption, I think it is you, Awal Hajjaj. And she has some harsh, you know, words against him and so on. So people, you know, were obviously like aware of his situation and even the scholars, you know, like whatever. So he makes this dua. Oh Allah, the people claim you will never forgive me, so forgive me. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, rahimahullah, one of the greatest scholars and khulafa of this religion, he said, by Allah, I wish that I had made that dua before him. It's an amazing dua, right, to, that the people want to restrict Allah's forgiveness and his mercy and claim that Allah will never ever forgive such a person. Only Allah knows, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just in all of his affairs and he will deal with him with his ultimate justice. So the point is here that it's, you know, these are issues that we have to be extremely careful about. And the issues that really like should be left to people who are learned and scholars, like when you speak about it from an Islamic principle, an Islamic point of view, right? This is an Islamic you know, ruling or what we should do as Muslims and so on. This isn't something which we should all get involved in. And I think that's an important point to remember, not least you know, for which that statement of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, rahimahullah, because we don't want to be held to account for it, right? لَهَا مَا كَسَبَتْ وَلَكُمْ مَا كَسَبْتُمْ وَلَا تُسْأَلُونَ عَمَّا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ For them is that which they earn, for you is that which you earn, and you will not be asked about them. And they will not be asked about you. And so when we have so many of our own issues to deal with, you know, why get involved in things that, you know, frankly, they don't really affect us in the here and now. And Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and our families and our children and our community. And may Allah Azza wa Jal um, give us strength and knowledge. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to what is correct. Barakallahu feekum. Jazakumullah khair. Inshallah next week, because when the clock's going back? Sunday? Sunday. So next week we're starting at 7, well 7 o'clock is Salat al-Isha in the masjid. 7.30 we're starting online, meaning the class will start at 7.30. But inshallah, you know, we're going to be here for Salat al-Isha, but the class will start at 7.30. Bithnillah. Jazakumullah khair. As-salamu alaykum.